good evening everyone and good morning the participants who are uh, like professor yugen fedel i on behalf of beyond law clc and ulas punjab university chandigarh welcome you all to another webinar on a, as we have promised that we try to engage everyone on different issues which are correlated with the society at large and we always bring topics wherein persons with different interests join and some people in fact are joining for all the webinars so that they can have a main bird eye view of all the issues like today we have global military reforms and military litigation in india as we all know that during this lockdown period yes it had been at the first instance a different perspective that we were all locked down at our homes one way was just keep on watching movies uh, on the netflix etc etc another way was to en enhance the knowledge in a different way one was through the youtube channels or other was like we all did that <clears throat> let's go for webinars and ask the experts the different uh, points different perspective on different issues so that if anybody had certain issues within their mind or if at all they did not know anything they could get enlightened from the experts amongst us today we have professor eugene fidel who teaches at the prestigious yale law school he is the president emeritus of us national institute of military justice he is an author of repute editor of blog global military justice reforms former jag officer of the us coast guard then we have uh, ashwarya bhati senior advocate supreme court of india who has been twice elected as a secretary of the supreme court bar association presently she is an additional advocate general of for state of up in supreme court she has been the counsel of delhi high court and supreme court and she has represented issues which are of larger interest of the society at large she has contributed in the legal fraternity which also in fact also ha has effect on larger issues of the society at large she was the counsel in the right to privacy criminalization the judgment of roger matthew etc then we have amongst us major navdeep singh an advocate of punjab and nana high court the place where i am also practicing he is a founder president of armed forces tribunal bar association of chandigarh he has authored various books and he has written various articles which in his own way help to understand the military law and the issues of the military keeping in view his immense knowledge he was made part of the high level committee of experts of the military of defense to reduce litigation initiated by mod his all three persons who are here have contributed a lot towards the global military reforms and military litigation in india we thought that why not bring the experts and have the views of the persons who have contributed immensely in resolving the issues especially in respect of military litigation in india and their write ups etc they can have helped us to think in a different way the reforms etc invariably we have all been holding webinars wherein the keynote speaker comes he pitches in his own views uh, in terms of the legal insights etc and then we have a question answer session we thought that we should uh, take this this time on a different pedestal we will just ask certain questions and then anybody can uh, post their questions on the group chat so that the questions and their resolutions to those can be had from any of the three persons who have their immense knowledge to contribute in their own way first uh, i will ask professor eugene fedel as to could you just explain the basic difference between the system of military justice and regular criminal justice more so since you have authored a book 
a very short introduction of military justice by the Oxford Press. Professor Uj, uh, you can fit in. Right. Good evening, everybody, or good morning, depending on your time zone. Um, so, <clears throat> the, the the starting point of the answer to your question is that military justice vindicates uh, an additional interest beyond simply uh, the achievement of justice that any system of criminal law seeks to achieve. The, uh, that second interest uh, has to do with ensuring discipline within the military so that any court-martial is supposed to not only do justice in conventional criminal law terms, but also to make sure that discipline is achieved and why is discipline important? Because discipline is important to uh, uh, mission, mission accomplishment. Uh, so that's, that, that's the starting point. Now, uh, historically, of course, the military justice system sprang from different roots, and this varies from country to country, obviously. But just thinking about the American system, which is vastly and needlessly complicated, uh, the military justice system actually predates our constitution. And so certain aspects of the military justice system have traditionally, and until this day, not tracked with the requirements that the constitution imposes either on our federal courts or our state court systems. All of our states are sovereign, we say, and all of them have their own court systems, which are uh, a, 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 an imperfect, a mirror of the requirements of the Constitution for federal courts. So that, for example, uh, in our antique Constitution, you can't be tried in a federal court uh, for a felony unless you've been indicted by a grand jury of 23 people. That doesn't, that requirement doesn't apply to the states, and it certainly doesn't apply to the military justice system. Uh, there's a, uh, an issue of uh, whether a jury has to be unanimous. This is a really recent issue. Uh, jury unanimity is not provided for in so many words in the Constitution, but the constitutional provision has been interpreted uh, from the beginning that a, uh, a trial jury in the federal courts had to be unanimous uh, and had to be 12 people, by the way. Uh, that Neither of those requirements until recently, uh, let me, let me, uh, be a little more precise here. Until very recently, the uh, uh, jury unanimity provision was not believed to apply to uh, the states unless the states happen to uh, adopt jury unanimity. And 49, I think 48 and then 49 uh, states have moved in that direction. But uh, under a very recent US Supreme Court case, jury unanimity is now required. Um, in contrast, uh, Except for capital cases, jury unanimity is not required in a court martial. Uh, so those are, you know, those are major differences. In fact, you could be convicted in a court martial consisting of as few as four people, possibly three. And Dwight can correct me. In some circumstances, you could have it down to three. Um, so there, there are major differences. On the other hand, there are also plenty of. Uh, uh, similarities, and uh, these include the rules of evidence. The rules of evidence as between civilian federal courts and courts martial are the same. Uh, there's a judge. The judge has a law degree, typically wears robes. Uh, there are lawyers uh, in every case, basically, on both sides. Uh, the, the judge instructs on the, the law, uh, does not deliberate with the members of the court martial panel, uh, so, in many, many respects, particularly over the last 50 years, the military justice system has assimilated more and more towards the civilian model. Uh, we don't have in this country a, uh, what, uh, what is known as a compliant system. I'm using the Strasbourg term. Uh, uh, and uh, neither, I believe, no offense, I, I don't believe the uh, Indian system is compliant either. Uh, and we can maybe get into that. Why don't I stop there because I don't want to monopolize the conversation. I'm very anxious to hear what other people have to say, and I'm also particularly anxious to uh, respond to any questions and stir things up a little bit. 
uh, uh, could you please tell us the latest trends in the global military justice reforms process according to you uh, uh, say that one more time please i'm sorry so could you please tell us the latest trends on the global reforms justice according to you right um well uh, I, th I think what you're seeing is a continuing trend. Again, we're talking about broad, broad uh, sweep. You're, you're seeing a continuing trend uh, towards uh, the integration of uh, military justice into the larger system. I think increasingly countries are recognizing that there's got to be appellate review by the country's highest court. Uh, I think... Uh, there, there is a, uh, there actually is a trend in, in a number of countries towards getting rid of their military justice system. Uh, I personally, I don't advocate that, but uh, but you can certainly find countries that have moved in that direction, uh, one way or another. I mean, every country has its own, you know, for political and traditional reasons, uh, way of uh, reconciling that. Um, I think a major issue uh, has to do with. Uh, the uh, the role of the command, the role of commanders in the administration of military justice. Uh, and I think a, a major trend is increasing interest, and I know uh, Navdeep Singh has been very engaged in this, uh, in the uh, administration of disciplinary punishments, the conduct of summary trials. Uh, and again, countries have different words for the same phenomenon, but this is how do you deal with minor uh, disciplinary matters? And I think there's an increasing, uh, at, at, I don't know that there's a trend at the moment, but there's an increasing anxiety that this is an overlooked area. And if I can, I've, I'll say two other things about overlooked areas. And I don't know if, if this is quite responsive to your question, because, but uh, the two other areas are, uh, I believe that the um, correctional programs, right, for uh, military prisoners uh, is a very understudied area. I, I think this is basically unknown territory. And uh, um, maybe because of the COVID-19 uh, situation where people are looking at prisons in ways that they haven't in the past, maybe that will spark some interest in that. And the other one is, and here I'll talk as a lawyer and a law teacher, uh, the the uh, number of ethical issues that seem to come up, questions of professional ethics. I, I think that is a, uh, there's some attention that's been paid to it in the past, but I think you're going to see more and more attention paid to it. Uh, as more and more uh, cases involve lawyers, inevitably, show me a lawyer and I'll show you ethical questions. <laughs> so <laughs> let me leave it at that. Uh, uh, so. Could you just throw light on some cases of in different jurisdiction that you consider as landmarks insofar as military justice is concerned? Sure. Um, in, uh, in the UK, of course, there's the Findlay case, which uh, wound up at Strasbourg. I mean, it, it, who knows where things are right now after Brexit, but it, actually Brexit doesn't affect Strasbourg, so I, I shouldn't make that connection. But, uh, it, you know, all the, all the cases that have been decided in Strasbourg that have affected and dramatically changed the UK justice system, Findlay is only one, uh, uh, Martin against the UK is another one, uh, those, and, and those in turn have had a kind of hydraulic effect uh, around the world. Uh, there's a case in Canada having to do with judicial independence called Genereux uh, some years ago, and there's a very recent case called Stillman that everybody should read from the Supreme Court of Canada uh, about uh, what are called service offenses. In other words, uh, an offense under civilian law, which uh, is absorbed into the uh, code of service discipline. Uh, and, and that's a common phenomenon in uh, those military justice systems that are um, uh, British inflected. Uh, there, there have been uh, major issues in South Africa uh, about um, the independence of the prosecutor, interesting uh, issues there. And in the US, we've had a host of issues uh, 
uh, a surprising number of which have actually gone to the U.S. Supreme Court, whose jurisdiction, of course, is entirely discretionary, well, for all practical purposes, entirely discretionary. Uh, for example, the Solorio case, what if an offense has no connection to the military, aside from the fact that the accused is a, uh, a serving member? Uh, held in 1987, Dwight can correct me, 84, 80, 87, uh, held, that doesn't matter as long as the individual is in the military, that's it. Uh, and that seems to be the law in Canada as well. I will tell you, uh, I'm involved in a case right now that uh, raises uh, very substantial issues, which I can get into later a little bit maybe, but it's, it's a pending case, so I'm a, a tiny bit tongue-tied but it has to do with prejudice, the exercise of uh, command influence by the President of the United States. And uh, unfortunately, we have had a string of uh, issues where the President has meddled in individual cases. The President and other political leaders have meddled in individual cases. And I would say, I don't know if it's a trend around the world, but what I'm seeing is uh, very, very disturbing and uh, we may, know more about it in uh, a few months' time, and if the case goes to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, in a year or two. Uh, so th that's some idea of where the major uh, issues have gone. That's a good insight. We, while sitting in India, could just have a peep into it. So could you just tell us about the historic Yale draft of 2018 prepared by global military jurists related to the existing UN draft principles of military justice wherein you had improved upon the United Nations military justice principles and handed over a new draft to the representative of the UN. What was your experience and what is your take on that? Right. Uh, this was in, in 2006, uh, the uh, UN uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, sponsored a, um, a set of draft principles governing the administration of uh, justice through military tribunals. These are the so-called DECO principles, D-E-C-A-U-X. The uh, primary uh, uh, leader of that effort was a Professor Emmanuel DECO from the University of Paris. Uh, basically, this was an effort to come up with, uh, let's say, generally accepted principles uh, for how uh, military courts should function. Uh, there were a few pressure points. I mean, were you ever going to permit a trial of a civilian in a military court? There are countries that do this repeatedly. They still do it. I mean, Uganda does it every Monday and Thursday. It's unbelievable. Uh, Egypt and uh, a number of the other uh, North African countries. Um, so th there were major issues, uh, issues of where you would try human rights violations. Suppose you have uh, military personnel who engage in uh, grave human rights violations. Do you trust the military justice system uh, to prosecute those, or do you say, no, those are off the table, those have got to be tried in a civilian court? Anyway, for a number of reasons, uh, the, the uh, DECO principles sort of ran aground. Uh, they, they lost their steam. They never got the final blessing of the General Assembly, and uh, they were just out there. And uh, when I uh, frankly, stumbled across the DECO principles. I, I can't recall where I first learned about them, but um, I, 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 I got involved at the tail end of that process, uh, and I watched with uh, 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 horror and disappointment that the, the, you know, the steam had gone out of the effort. And finally, uh, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Yale Law School support and uh, the goodwill of a number of people, and in fact, some who were involved here, I see Navdeep, and I think Dwight was involved in this process. We ran a, um, uh, a relook uh, at Yale Law School. We had a workshop on the DECO principles. We put our heads together. We had some wonderful um, uh, student research assistants, and we updated them. And it turns out that in the time since 2006, even though the General Assembly had not you know, performed the benediction over the DECO principles. Slowly, 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 the DECO principles were kind of seeping into the discussion. You'd see references to them in human rights, you know, the NGO literature. You'd see references to them in national court decisions. You'd see references to them 
uh, on the floor of the House of Lords. Who knew? Uh, and, uh, you know, eventually, eventually, it just seemed that we, we had to do something uh, to move this thing forward. And, and that's what we've done. And, and uh, after a lot of preparation and a very intensive weekend of work, we had a draft that was smooth enough that we passed it off to the special rapporteur on independence of judges and lawyers. Uh, that's the, the mandate holder at the UN that whose portfolio includes this kind of thing. Uh, and we're frankly hoping that uh, the UN will uh, find the time and find some sponsor, some national sponsor, to uh, light a fire under this project. That, that would be a good deed for the Indian government, by the way. Anybody know anyone in the Indian government? Well, I have you. <laughs> it, it would be nice if somebody in the foreign ministry were to, uh, uh, you know, send a, a telegram to uh, Geneva and say, why don't you hold another hearing on this stuff and let's, let's get rolling because there's no reason why we shouldn't have a 21st century state of the art set of generally accepted principles where we could help countries that are grappling with these issues uh, to, you know, to get modern, uh, sensible uh, procedures, institutional arrangements that foster public confidence in the administration of justice. I mean, the country, the only country I know right now, actually there are two, South Africa and Fiji are in the middle of major overhauls. But, uh, you know, they're taking divergent positions. I think at least in Fiji, it will be a compliant system because uh, I know who the person is that's working with the Fiji government. Uh, and he, in fact, was involved in the Yale workshop. But I, I think, uh, this is really a uh, an effort that people should study, and uh, the Yale draft principles are available on the website of the National Institute of Military Justice. Excuse me, on the uh, Global Military Justice Reform blog. Let me say that again: Global Military Justice Reform. If you simply type that into your search engine, it'll take you to the website, and then use the search function on the site. Just look for Yale. Yale draft and, and you'll get it. And I hope everybody takes a minute and, uh, or a few minutes to uh, see what's there. And you know, if we got things wrong, I'd love to know about it. If we got things right, tell the UN. It's a good, good take. And especially the persons who will try to Google today will not feel <laughs> difficult because the topic itself, it's divided into two parts. And the first part deals only on this uh, global justice reform. So while Googling that, it will be easy. Uh, Great. Uh, thank you, Professor Fidel. We are having questions. We will have, have the end of it. Now we have, I will just pose certain questions from Ashwarya Bhatti. If there had been something like TRP on uh, the social media, months after the judgment on the short commission, I think if anybody could just go on the upswing of the social media on the TRP part, if it is to be correlated, I suppose you are the one who has actually created history uh, it's the entire different, I can just see Navdeep just passing on the smile because he, he has also immensely contributed in that. Nobody can shy away from the fact that <laughs> both of you have contributed tremendously for the military service. I was, because since that judgment has a relevance and though it just, it was widely covered in the media, etc. Uh, we, we are feeling enamored on the fact that we are having you on this platform of Beyond Law CLC. To have the insights uh, as we say, a straight talk from the per person who was at the helm of the affairs, Navdeep and Ashwarya. Uh, Ashwarya, could you just tell your experience towards this recent landmark judgment of the Permanent Commission to the Woman in the Army? How was the journey from the Delhi High Court to the Supreme Court? What challenges were you faced? How did you actually, uh, you and Navdeep, thought of looking into the law? Once there's a settled law, it's not difficult. But if you okay. try to build something on a different pedestal. Sometimes at the first instance, myself being a lawyer, I find that sometimes when, once you are there, at the back of the mind, you have you always face what difficulties there could be. And as a, as a lawyer, you would also have to see as to how, what are the challenges, what the judge can ask, and especially once you have won the first round and second going to that. Firstly, share your experience on that. And that what were the challenges within the mental block, how to go about it, and how to actually hammering the point in the right perspective. 
first we will take your take and then Navdeep. So I, I must clarify though that I, I wasn't involved in uh, in the permanent commission case uh, uh, in the litigation per se. Uh, I was involved in the uh, tribunalization case with her. Okay. <laughs> so it's entirely her her effort and, and her victory and we are so proud of it. Well, thank you. The, thank the you. mental sport. The mental sport is always enough. No, no, thank you. Yeah, of course, uh, thank you, Vikas Ji. My very warm greetings to all of, uh, to everybody uh, who's here from different time zones. It's a beautiful day here in Delhi, I can tell you, and uh, I'm sure it must be a beautiful day um, after being very, having very hot days for, for several days. Uh, you know, whether, uh, actually, Navdeep Ji and I have been uh, sort of partners in military issues and military justice uh, matters everywhere, uh, you know, that we have. And even if Navdeep Ji and I are not really working together, I always make a point to, you know, pick his brain and, you know, uh, run my thoughts through him. I ran my written submissions through him in this matter, and I have called him umpteen number of times. I take him as a as a friend, philosopher, and guide in all military matters. And I, why not? I mean, a person who's your friend with such immense in, uh, experience available to you, you must take. And these are issues which you know take the nation forward, which which are important issues not just for nation but for uh, you know for, for gender justice across the world. Uh, it was. Uh, Frankly, Vikasji, for me, it was a privilege to be part of this journey. It was, it was incredible that I got to uh, be the lawyer for for this incredible journey and representing some really courageous and brave women who were, uh, who were assets, who are assets, continue to be assets for the Indian Army. Indian Army's judgment was the first one to come. <clears throat> we subsequently had the judgment for the uh, naval women officers also. The Air Force officers matter is uh, is still going on. Uh, we will expect a judgment soon on it. Uh, but of course, it's it's once the, the the army judgment is there, it's a dominoes effect for the rest. You know, sharing some of the some of the challenges that we had. Of course, Delhi High Court gave us a great great judgment back in 2010 itself, March 2010. Uh, Bench of Justice Sanjay Kishan Paul uh, gave the judgment and said that uh, uh, permanent commission has to be a given, and it was it was a very interesting. Uh, you know, parity, and they said that where if women are good enough for short service commission, then they are good enough for uh, for permanent commission. Actually, it did not uh, tinker with the military policies of having them in newer areas or you know newer arms or combat roles. Or in fact, that was not even in the issue. But uh, it it was actually you know in in a very beautifully simplified form and uh, acknowledging parity. Unfortunately, the the uh, the battle in Supreme Court took a full decade. And the union's petitions were filed soon after in 2010, and uh, they remained pending. We saw a lot of political dilly dally, and you know, uh, initially we saw that the government wanted to give a permanent commission. Uh, subsequently, after much ado, it was announced in 2018 uh, that uh, as a policy decision, they are granting permanent commission to women officers. But uh, interestingly, even after that policy decision having been taken by the highest uh, echelons of uh, the political decision making, when it was being implemented, the notification that came in March 2019, which granted permanent commission, even in execution of it, they found disparity. So they were, they, the, the authorities wanted to uh, not give the benefit of permanent commission to existing women officers, women officers who had been fighting this battle. They wanted to apply it prospectively. And another uh, very strong uh, issue that we raised before the court was that in the execution, they said that they will confine uh, women officers to just uh, staff appointments. Now in the military, they there are criteria appointments and there are staff appointments. Now criteria appointments, uh, you know, in, in uh, common parlance are like the meteor roles. They are the command positions. They are, uh, they are you know, not just desk jobs. They are better positions, better roles. Um, and uh, we raised an issue that, you know, even while granting permanent commission, the government is actually discriminating with them. And then the whole battle started all over again. And uh, we saw excuses being made, uh, all kinds of excuses about biological duties of women, them being inferior, you know, they're, they're having maternity duties and, uh, you know, uh, men not being stereotypical men not being able to take command from women officers because of their social background. All these kinds of arguments were raised before the Supreme Court. And uh, actually, I felt that those arguments became, uh, became the pivot for this uh, strong judgment to come. If, if these flimsy arguments had not been raised, I mean, 
it's 2020, you can't raise these kind of arguments. And <clears throat> interestingly, when we did research <clears throat> of similar battles across the world, we found that it was the very same kind of arguments that had been raised across different jurisdictions. So it's, it's very interesting that on gender issues, it's very uncanny actually, that on gender issues, uh, geographies or the level of developments or where you know the aspirations of the society or the modernization has very little impact and it's the same kind of issues that are thrown at women uh, you know on different points and uh, I'm, I'm like really proud to say that Supreme Court called the bluff <clears throat> they called the bluff and they demolished the entire argument and they said that you know a battling a gender parity is like is, is confronting uh, the the mindset the problem is really with the mindset the stereotypical mindset is the problem and the constitutional guarantees uh, and dignity does not uh, does not have any space for these kind of arguments uh, what is an, also amazing is that the supreme court has examples of these amazing women who had been performing it was not like you know we were dealing with an experiment anymore women have been in the indian military services in the indian army air force and navy since 1991 1992 so having been, uh, you know, having been uh, performing their shoulder to shoulder in their military duties, to today call them that, okay, no, you're good enough only for five years, 10 years, or maximum 14 years, but sorry, not for 20 years, or you're inferior. It was, it was a bluff that was completely demolished by the Supreme Court in very strong words. And uh, I realized the full potential of it only after we got the judgment. Because I had calls from people across the world, people who were interested in this journey and who wanted to tell our story. Um, and, you know, it, it was covered by media across the world. And I, it was wonderful that um, actually privileged for me that I was part of it. Uh, one uh, issue which was uh, a common man or any other person would like, was it being opposed by the government itself or there were certain men, etc., oriented, moving an application for impeachment? Uh, saying that this shouldn't be done, it will hamper in this way. I just wanted a uh, peep into that. So, Vikasji, there were no impeachment applications by gentlemen officers. In fact, uh, you know, getting from there, there were, we, we gave to the court some examples of some of the communications that happened between these women officers and their jawans. You know, the jawans addressed these women officers as Sabji. There were very interesting messages that said, uh, you know, Sabji tadke aap CEO banoge, Sabji badhaiyo. And these women officers said these men who are supposed to be from that, uh, you know, that rural background that they can't probably take command from women, they don't even see us as women. They see us only as officers. That is why they don't even bother to call us, us as ma'am. They are fine to call us as sabji. Sabji is like sir, uh, for those who are not familiar with the Hindi language. So, uh, so uh, I think the problem really is the mindset of the institution. The problem is uh, really with, uh, you know, trying to, uh, use women, uh, you know, for or, or showcase them uh, as uh, role models, or you know, parade them on the Rajpath, or you know, today we are we have women doing uh, even in the combat roles. We have women in all the three arms in the combat roles. But uh, increasingly, uh, I mean, the system actually shuts its door when when it comes to changes and when it co comes to gender issues. I think there's a similar kind of problem. So that's how my experience was. Somebody had just asked what would be the title of the case. So Babita I can tell you. Yeah. Babita Punia, it's a, a Secretary Ministry of Defense Union of India versus Babita Punia. Uh, that's the army matter. And the naval matter is uh, Union of India versus Annie Nagraj. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> do you find that you have dealt with this army as well as Navy, now the Air Force? Are there any subtle differences of line of arguments or according to you, it will flow in the normal one? No, there are uh, uh, differences. In fact, so the army kept on resisting till the end, but the Air Force and the Navy had granted permanent commission to women officers in 2006, 2007, uh, and implemented it from 2008. But they also implemented it prospectively. So there, there was this battle for women officers who had been uh, short service commission officers prior to 2006, and they had been denied prior to 2008, actually, when they executed it. But interestingly, in the Navy, in the Navy matter, the Union of India argued that there is really no gender discrimination because uh, this is the same uh, criteria being meted out to gentlemen officers of the Navy also, and uh, they don't mix streams. So all short service commission officers stay as short service, and uh, permanent commission officers are permanent commission. 
actually we had to take the plea of uh, facially neutral discrimination you know the cause effect because there are some legislations which on the face of it appear to be neutral that oh well we don't give to women we don't give to men but you have to dig a little deeper you have to scratch the surface and see what is the effect of it what is the impact of it and then you realize that for well for gentlemen officers in the navy and the air force they they were two you know there was a broader door of permanent commission available and there was a smaller window of shop service commission available so it was not like they they did not have the lot bigger door available to them and for women officers uh, that bigger door opened for them only in 2008 so ultimately you know the, the our battle was that you can't have gender as a, uh, a, a as a disqualification you have to assess their their uh, their suitability uh, and uh, their merit and it can't be that gender cannot give them something extra but again gender cannot be a shutdown for them for anything that they rightfully deserve uh, and ma'am uh, what is your take uh, that since you and navdeep have worked together on military related litigation in some cases you have worked together including for disabled soldiers and uh, widows what is your take on the military litigation well like all litigation fueled by the uh, the government of india which which remains the biggest litigant in uh, in our country unfortunately despite a lot of effort there were great recommendations made by the committee that navdeep ji was part of and uh, they they actually uh, you know uh, navdeep ji i'm sure will talk more about it but we didn't see much uh, impact on the ground we we saw that uh, you know mindless litigation litigation which uh, which should have been uh, taken and after all when you're talking about military litigation it cannot be adversarial there are very few things which are like court martial related issues which should be taken as adversarial benefits issues you know where you have when you're forcing uh, widows or where you're forcing uh, retired soldiers to you know to 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 march right up to the highest court of the country uh, for issues which which are, which are their entitlements which are their rights it is beyond my comprehension frankly and and we saw very little impact it the the, the more things change the more they remain the same uh, we haven't seen any any real change and it's it's actually in fact there, there was a problem with the tribunalization matter and you know relating to that we had a judgment where the, you know they said of course Uh, when i was hearing professor pedel it was very interesting to note that uh, uh, you know the the streams are very different there so either it is the uh, you know the civilian justice system or the military justice system interestingly in indian system the military justice system also rolls into the civilian courts so uh, after the aft of aft of course comprises of uh, judges uh, and uh, uh, retired officers but after that everything rolls into the regular courts and uh, there is a judicial review of of, of um, uh, at different levels so we we were having problems by bypassing of the high courts now bypassing of the high courts gave uh, you know made actually the liti uh, the defense litigation the military litigation even more cumbersome because uh, you were forcing and there's only just one supreme court in the country that's the apex court you know it's for it's for important questions of law of general public importance it's not for pension related issues or you know uh, 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 disability pension related issues these are issues which have to be decided on a on a on a precedent law that is already there but unfortunately too many of them come up to supreme court and it's of course government is all powerful they have their battery of lawyers but it's very very difficult for soldiers and widows to fight their battles thankfully we have lawyers like navdeep and uh, yourself who, who just go whenever there is something pinching them and the participants who are there uh, as uh, ma'am bhatti told aft would be armed force tribunal that is where in the people who have certain grievances with the armed forces uh, go there i will uh, take a call from uh, ma'am bhatti and then navdeep that what was the journey then when the tribunalization issue came it was uh, that the judgment came which said that the the after the aft h1 has to go to the supreme court then after a journey just like you said for the 10 years you fought for the commissioned officers permanent commission that how that tribunalization came how that roger matthews came how that initial judgment of l chandra kumar was there then madras tribunal all these judgments how how that journey was we will take all these issues 
uh, Ma'am Bhatti, what what would you like to see the changes in the attitude of the official establishment for military litigation, or for that matter, for any litigation? As you said, once you go to the litigation, question is the any organization, even though we have certain judgments to that effect, which says that similarly situated persons should be given relief automatically. Not one, but there are a large number of precedents to stay therein. And there are instructions, at least of Punjab Haryana to the effect, which have adopted the judgment of Sardvi Singh versus State of Haryana, way back of 2002. Now we are 18 years ahead of that. We can say that the that judgment has also attained mature, maturity, majority, because it's 18 years journey. Yet, you find not only of civil law, but other judgments also, which speak of the fact that despite there being instructions issued, yet we have same rigor moles of written statement, etc. I was just reading a very old article of Navdeep written there, and I was just reminded, which said that the government has such a policy, let's assume even if you have to plead, pleading is that what you want to hammer a point. Even if you write that sun rises from the east, in that eventuality, this, the government will come and file a reply and the written statement to the effect, uh, it is denied for want of knowledge, or they will come and say wrong and denied being incorrect, or they will also hammer a point that sun does not rise in the east because there are sometimes dark days also, and sun in fact never rises. So I was just reminded <laughs> when I talked, I just asked Navdeep, just chip in. And when you were coming, I was thinking that yes, the government has this policy. It is just like sometimes to say that uh, actually demonstrate that the ice would always float on water. But the government will always come with a, this thing. They say no, ice will never float on the water because the ice will automatically melt in the water of the temperature. and. There's no water, there's no ice, therefore the ice can never float on the water. I, I can see Navdeep and Fidel kind of smiling across. Um, uh, I will just ask uh, Navdeep and still we are having questions pouring on the chat box and the participants who are there, they are also live on Facebook. We will take questions also from the Facebook as such. So we will take the questions also. I thought that we have seen a lot of Navdeep smiling, but as we say, deep is akin to a deeper. So he's the illuminating light on the military law system itself. He has helped us in large number of judgments. As you said, that I also sometimes bother him in the morning, late night, evening. Okay, what is the law, the military law? Just as we say, uh, invariably, uh, Professor Fidel and Bhati Ma'am would agree that invariably they say that where there's a law, there is a flaw. And where there is a flaw, there has to be a lawyer. And when there is a lawyer, uh, and especially in the military law, it has to be Navdeep Singh, according to me. And that is why he was a founder president and his insights of that, we will ask Navdeep, how was his journey in this tribunalization and his insights already actually uh, sometimes break in effect before we ask Navdeep. As but, uh, Bhati, uh, Bhati Ji was saying, I'll just ask, you said a dominoes effect. I just thought it just crept in my mind because during this COVID-19, that sometimes the mind is so blocked. Sometimes one relates domino means domino's pizza. What is the domino effect according to you? The domino's effect is those small uh, dominoes you would have seen. People go to uh, you know uh, uh, a lot of length to arrange those dominoes, and they are arranged in a manner that you know you just need to push that first domino. And the domino's effect is that you no know, matter how many hundreds and thousands of dominoes are arranged in different configurations. They all come down with that one push, one push to that one domino. Uh, uh, while taking leave from Fidel, I, I will say in Hindi they say, "Ek cycle giri or cycle girti gay. Uh, something like that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> or a ripple of waves which continue to have their own effect in a, a, a large one. I will ask uh, Navdeep uh, certain questions, then we go to the Q and A part. Navdeep, uh, continuing from the questions which we asked. Uh, Bhattiji to ask, would you like tell the state of military litigation in India, what do you feel that there are changes required in the mindset? What are the changes where people can learn? Thankfully, I was just uh, one day, uh, since we are also on the Facebook, despite the fact that we are also on the contact call, that you have launched a book, but during these dark days, the only way was that one could only wait on the military law book. I would also like what you have written on that book, what, what help it can help the lawyers as well as a common fraternity on your, that judgment and the, your journey while writing as a lawyer, what is that? So 
So what is your take on this military litigation or for that matter, any litigation where law, you know it very well, that once uh, um, has been done? Yeah. Yes, just, just as, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so just as uh, Ms. Bhatti was saying, uh, and, and, and you also referred to one of my uh, old op-eds, uh, you know, that's a true real-life incident wherein a judge said that if, if you file a writ petition saying that the sun rises in the east, the Ministry of Defense or the Army will file an affidavit saying, no, sir, the sun rises in the west. So that's actually a real-life incident. It happened in our high court. So, uh, see, uh, on, a, on a more serious note, the, the thing is that what change I would like to see is on the military side, uh, in, you know, especially for many of our young uh, JAG officers who are also uh, right now on the on on this uh, webinar, that I would like them not to get personally involved in litigation. The biggest problem in li uh, military litigation is that it's mostly a litigation of ego. It's mostly you know a litigation of prestige. That even if a case is not made out, you get so much personally involved that oh, how did how did this person, you know, win a case against the mighty Union of India or against the army. So that attitude must change. And if you want to fight out a case, please, please fight it out on a on a legal issue. Please uh, definitely appeal against it or or file, uh, uh, you know, a writ uh, against it. If you actually feel that there is a legal point involved and, and it will set a wrong precedent, for example, in many cases involving discipline or even in certain cases involving promotion, as uh, uh, Ms. Ashwarya uh, Bhatti was saying. But um, if you if you just uh, make every single uh, petition a, a, a prestige issue that no, we cannot allow uh, the person to win, uh, then then I think it's a downhill. And that's why I say when I when I compare uh, litigation, you know, with the Ministry of Home Affairs in the High Court, or even with Punjab and Haryana. There are times when there is moral courage shown and, and uh, the officer concerned in the uh, who's present in the court would say that, yes, my lord, it's a covered case or that, yes, we should concede. Or they sim simply, you know, uh, say that, yes, a case is made out and we were wrong. But um, over here, there is so much of fear and, and young officers who are defending cases are under so much of pressure that they want to win cases, just win cases by hook or crook. And, and uh, there is so much of pressure from the outside that, you know, there are signals coming in, there are telephone calls and they're going out, sir, this, you know, this happened in the case and the, the senior guy will say, oh, no, please tell the court this, don't, don't lose this case. So getting personally involved in any litigation is not a good idea. And this is one thing which I would like, uh, this, uh, this is one aspect in which I would like to see a positive change that uh, uh, the system, the military hierarchy must remain totally dispassionate about litigation. Fight it out on points, on legal issues, but not don't get personally involved and don't uh, you know make it a, a, a win or lose situation in such a manner that as if you're fighting a sport, mm -hmm. if, uh, as if you're uh, you know in a sports tournament that you have to win at any cost. So that system should change. Um, so um, so yes, and 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 also we have also seen that uh, at uh, many stages and in many cases the pers the pol political executive would have a different opinion, but the lower functionaries would come up with such excuses on file notings, etc., that they give an entire twist to litigation. For example, the uh, case in, in, in the permanent commission issue, uh, 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 Mrs. Bhatti knows it very well, that the prime minister himself made a statement, you know, from the red fort that we are going to grant permanent commission to women. Uh, later on, the the submissions in the court were absolutely at variance with what the political executive wanted and and i must uh, place it on record that once uh, uh, miss bharti won that case the next day the raksha mantri the defense minister himself tweeted that he was happy for for uh, the fact that the the women had won the case and and mrs bharti had won the case in the sense saying that i'm happy that we lost the case so so even there are there are cases where in the political executive has a different opinion, and later on in courts, the lower the the lower um, levels uh, or the officials down below, uh, you know, give an entire spin uh, to the issue. So th these are the things I would like to see. I, I I would like to see a change in bringing in a little more moral courage and not getting personally involved uh, in litigation. So your take and my experience has also been why we restrict only to the military. I have seen for that matter any institution invariably comes with the same despite the fact 
and uh, as a lawyer you will always find that even if we mention it and uh, heart within heart like ashwarya as a additional advocate general of up also then as a lawyer one will always plead the facts and that the judgment of are distinct and distinguishable that would not apply to the said judgment so that continues to over but as a fair counsel ultimately even if uh we speak on that ultimately as a fair counsel you would always say yes we have taken a stand but without the concession the judgments are to that effect then uh, this ms uh, bhatti and you can share what was your what has been your uh, experience this tribunalization this journey the that l chandra kumar's judgment then judgment uh, to the effect that no aft was straight away with the deep of the court which you will find that invariably in other uh, acts at least i have experienced there was not nothing seeking a leave that you should grant us the leave that we are to go to nsl uh, slp or for that matter the high court once it is a take that bench the higher forum where you go would automatically take uh, as to whether it's a fit case or not but to take a leave from that court itself to the effect that yes kindly grant me the leave i want to challenge your order at least uh, heart within heart i have not been able to reconcile to that fact that asking that you should have a certificate that you can go and challenge that what is your take on that yes uh, i would i would just give a background of tribunalization and mrs bhati and i were involved in this uh, issue very uh, uh, deeply see firstly let's let's not forget that tribunalization is the resultant of the emergency it came out uh, you know through the 42nd amendment the uh, 42nd constitutional amendment and um, the it's an emergency era uh, uh, you know uh, uh, system except for example we have we had you know income tax appellate tribunal which came about in 1941 and uh, uh, etc and and other tribunals within the judicial system but this uh, tribunals that we see today cat aft ngt etc etc th these are a resultant of the 42nd um, uh, amendment now the idea at that point of time was that take out the jurisdiction of constitutional courts give it to these executive controlled or executive man bodies and in a way hamper uh, or or uh, put uh, obstacles uh, in the way of judicial independence so that was the idea behind um, uh, the 42nd amendment through which tribunals came came into play but over the years uh, the high courts and the supreme court they they you know uh, chiseled away many of those uh, draconian provisions and interpreted things in a manner that uh, uh, there has to be independence of tribunals and and the, the system cannot be so far removed from the um a regular uh, judicial system that uh, you know person says that uh, this is a body which is functioning under the executive but unfortunately those judgments have not been complied with properly now for example eljendra kumar said that uh, uh, direct appeals to the supreme court would make justice inaccessible and unaffordable see flouted uh, to the hilt in in many acts including you know the national green tribunal the armed forces tribunal etc etc of course now it has been toned down by the supreme court but but uh, a total contravention then madras bar association said that you have to give longer uh, tenures to yeah. members uh, so uh, that r gandhi said that give longer tenures to members to ensure stability again flouted to the hilt and currently let's take the example of armed forces tribunal a uh, judge uh, can at best get 3 years after retiring from the high court at 62 the person retires at 65 from the tribunal so 3 years is a maximum and practically speaking they're just getting about 1 year 1 and a half year so again flouted to the hilt then madras bar association 2 said that the uh, secretary of the department against which the tribunal has to pass orders will not sit in the selection committee again uh, flouted to the hilt uh, let's see for example in armed forces tribunal the defense ministry is the first party but the defense secretary through the defense secretary and the defense secretary is also part of the selection committee which is uh, selecting adjudicating members so so uh, the uh, the tribunal functions under the thumb of the opposite party and the person uh, the secretary of the department concerned himself is sitting uh, for selecting members and then the the infrastructure the manpower etc etc is all controlled by the ministry of defense uh, and this affects the tribunals those tribunals more wherein the uh, other side is mostly the union um, including you know the national green tribunal the tdsat it does not affect 
some certain other tribunals for example you know consumer commission sector it doesn't matter whether it's functioning under the government or not then l chandra kumar and and r gandhi again said that all tribunals should be placed under the ministry of law and justice and not under uh, administrative parent ministries against which they have to pass orders again not implemented and in roger matthew uh, these rules which were uh, which again emasculated uh, so to say the functioning of tribunals were struck down uh, with the help of mr datar and uh, mrs bhati but again the new rules uh, are a, a reflection of the old rules so the journey continues and even after getting you know uh, around 20 judgments from the high courts uh, and the supreme court including constitution benches we are still scratching the surface and not uh, we haven't reached that stage of independence that uh, we should get now coming to the aft see the uh, court martial system uh, uh, even in, uh, in the indian jurisprudence is a little flawed in it Uh, contravenes the uh, uh, you know international convention on civil and political political rights article 14 which says that you must have an independent impartial and competent tribunal uh, which 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 also covers military tribunals uh, that is courts martial but uh, our system is that uh, the 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 jury the judge advocate the prosecution and uh, the evidence collection system everything functions under the thumb of one one single authority which is the authority which is uh, you know uh, looking for the conviction of the person so there is no independence there is no prosecutorial independence there is no independent director of prosecution there is uh, no one to oversee uh, the, that the prosecution is independent so to say even the basic uh, independence is lacking so prithipal singh bedi's case by the supreme court they said that you must have a, 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 a one level of appeal over courts martial and that's how the idea of aft came about it was only meant to be uh an appellate court for courts martial not for service matters but when when they um, started you know uh, uh drafting the act they included service matters also on the lines of a central administrative tribunal and they made it a hybrid kind of a tribunal which would uh, uh, hear appeals against courts martial and also determine service matters so that is how the aft came into play uh another thing in tribunalization on a whole is that uh, they were these bodies were created to you know take the burden of the regular judiciary or to to say that they'll provide inexpensive justice and the pendency will decrease however i fail to understand that when in instead of a, a court you are arguing a case in a tribunal how does it uh, uh, you know reduce the burden on on the the costs or the burden on the pockets of a petitioner i fail to understand how is how is it inexpensive one two pendency is also a myth uh, to take the example again of the aft uh, at the time of the creation of the aft the pendency in the high courts was 9000 and the the matters were transferred to the aft saying that oh the high courts are getting overburdened in such cases now as on date the pendency is 17000 i think so so where has the pendency the pendency has not reduced and this demonization of the high courts saying that they will be um, uh, overburdened or we require expertise i i absolutely disagree with that because high courts are constitutional courts uh, the supreme court is a constitutional court nobody can emulate the independence of a high court and this um, expertise is also i i personally feel that it's uh, uh, you know overvalued because uh, it in, in fact getting an expert Uh, into the system of tribunals makes the uh, since experts are over familiar with their with, the, with their matters and have worked in the same uh, uh, you know system uh, it makes justice subjective uh, to an extent uh, although yes uh, expertise can help but but uh, i i think uh, this has been blown out of proportion that uh, some kind of expertise you know, tomorrow somebody will say that a district judge should not go into medical jurisprudence unless you have a, a doctor sitting with him Uh, or or you'll say that uh, you know uh, tax matters should not be dealt unless you have a retired uh, uh, revenue service officer sitting with the judge so it, i i uh, judges are supposed to be experts of experts and the and the uh, duty to provide expertise is of the two sides you know one side is arguing one uh, one way for one for, for the petitioner the other side is uh, arguing for the respondent so they are supposed to provide expertise to the bench and the bench is supposed to decide the matter and uh, so i uh, sincerely feel that uh, although tribunalization uh, you know in some form or the other is uh, uh, you know unavoidable for uh, technical uh, issues or 
where uh, a high degree of scientific expertise is required. But to say that uh, everything should be, there should be all round tribunalization, I don't agree with it. An excessive tribunalization must be resisted uh, to preserve the independence of judiciary. Now, coming to your point of directly going from the AF to the Supreme Court, that was a death knell uh, for, for litigants because, um, you know, expecting a, a litigant to uh, uh, appear in the Supreme Court for defending small little things is, is a gone case. And the act, the AFT Act used to say that, uh, it still says that you can approach the Supreme Court only if there's a point of law of general public importance, which is in 99.999% cases, it is impossible. You know, general public importance in a pensionary matter or a service matter or even in a court martial is absolutely impossible. So it's great that uh, with efforts of Mrs. Bhatti and uh, 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 Mr. Arvind Datar that we, uh, you know, ultimately got a judgment. Uh, although one larger bench is still pending, but that judgment says that no, you cannot take away the jurisdiction of the High Court at all and uh, direct uh, uh, asking people to approach the Supreme Court directly makes justice in unaffordable and inaccessible. They've reiterated El Chandra Kumar. They've said that no, El High Court cannot be uh, you know, taken off the grid uh, as far as military matters are concerned. Uh, and, and the, the, uh, before we proceed further, I'll just uh, ask because I was just seeing that since uh, Ashwaraji and you as a lawyer, sometimes you are so well versed with the facts. Sometimes they just drib It's just like you are dribbling the ball in a ho ho while playing hockey. You don't even realize that the other participants are just watching. You said Roger Matthews. I would just say Roger Matthews trying to explain that R Gandhi and what is the take on that? Because large number of participants, especially on the Facebook or on this platform, might not know what did actually this R Gandhi. What terms did it contemplate? And what did this Roger Matthews say? at least for the benefit of the other people. Yes. I, I am so, yes. knowing it. Yes, so so R. Gandhi uh, was the uh, matter in the Supreme Court Constitution bench, again, argued by Mr. Arvind Dattar, who has been a great support to uh, me and uh, Mrs. Bhatti, also personally senior advocate, um, a, a great person. So R. Gandhi was argued by him. So uh, R. Gandhi said that uh, it, it was dealing with the company law tribunal, the NCLT and the NCLAT. So um, they laid down a few principles. The first principle was that um, the tribunals must function under the Ministry of Law and Justice and not under um, the parent administrative ministry, not yet implemented. The second principle was that you should have a longer tenure for uh, members, at least five to seven years, not yet implemented. The third thing was that uh, 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 that uh, mm -hmm. you cannot have vague criteria such as uh, a person can be an expert in management, accountancy, business, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and and join as a member. Again, in in the new rules, uh, still we find such such clauses. So for other tribunals, not yet implemented. Um, then came uh, Madras Bar Association, which in which the entire National Tax Tribunal Act was struck down, and uh, the uh, tribunal itself was quashed, saying that this tribunal cannot, uh, you know, be instituted, inserted. So in in that case also. Uh, they said that the um, uh, uh, tribunal will not function under the same ministry against which it has to pass orders and that uh, it must have full independence and that the secretary of the concerned department will not sit in the selection of members. Again, not imp yet implemented. El Chandra Kumar, of course, is the first uh, seven judge bench uh, judgment dealing with these matters in a very detailed uh, manner, wherein it said that direct appeals to the Supreme Court uh, uh, cannot, uh, you know, be uh, the... the uh, I mean, it cannot be incorporated in law that you go directly from a tribunal to the Supreme Court. That is impossible. You cannot uh, take away the power of judicial review of a high court, which is also a constitutional court. Uh, then El Chandra Kumar also reiterated that the Ministry of Law and Justice should take uh, control of the tribunals and you must have an independent agency. Then again, it spoke of uh, much of independence, etc. And uh, Roger Mark Matthew case was a case wherein the uh, Supreme Court has now reiterated these principles and said that uh, when you make rules uh, concerning the tribunals, please follow the law laid down in all these landmark judgments, all these constitutional law judgments, um, constitution bench judgments. So that is uh, uh, our, uh, Roger Matthew, and they've they've struck down the um, uh, offending rules, and they've also said that uh, direct again reiterated that no direct appeals from from uh, the tribunals directly directly to the Supreme Court, and please rework on the rules uh, wherein these direct appeals have been provided. Uh, I will take a call from 
ऐश्वर्य जी आई थिंक दिस प्रिंसिपल दैट द मिनिस्ट्री हु अंडर होम दैट ट्राइब्यूनल विल कम शुड नॉट बी पार्ट ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन आई थिंक द प्रिंसिपल ब्रॉडर प्रिंसिपल would have been that nobody can be judged in its own case number 1 and number 2 uh, let's assume the person who is appointing him it would always the person as we say there are certain types of biases so probably that factor of bias to the effect that the person who is appointed by a person against whom the decision is to be given probably that factor slightly might hinge in the mind of a judge howsoever he may have been appointed that he could have that the he has been appointed by that authority itself and then let's assume the judgment is there and then you pull them up on a, that ground that you are not implementing the judgments what is your take you are right in that in fact our petition did mention uh, many of these grounds uh, which are seemingly small issues but i mean we have to see that the cause of uh, justice dispensation uh has to be taken a, at a completely different level the the kind of immunity that is provided to the judges of the constitutional courts and uh, judges who are dispensing justice even at the lower judiciary levels that immunity that independence that segregation is necessary so that they can carry out their duty without fear or favor you know uh, it's not just about appointment vikas ji the the rules prescribed are are so uh, uh, lopsided that for leaves for get for for leave for getting a leave from as a judge or you know for approval of that for getting a house for some other benefits i mean for for everything you have to pretty much go uh, to the person who is the first respondent in your court when you are dispensing justice it doesn't work like that you you have to have uh, you have to give the idea of justice dispensation a higher pedestal you cannot have the respondent ministries Uh, you know approving their leaves and uh, benefits etc so that that's a huge parity there uh, of course uh, navdeep and mr fidel would also agree that as long as there is no independent thought process or they are not actually the strings of their control i would say in a different way are not in the hands of those persons till then the judgments would not in all fairness though we we haven't faced such things but yes these do affect the delivery justice system and another issue what navdeep was saying that r gandhi and all said that give a 5 year 7 year terms like we all know that there are certain tribunals for the term is for 3 years a judge super judge completes its 3 years term and for good one year we don't even have an appointment for that and uh, navdeep knows it like in aft in large number of cases like we all know that there are two set of systems a judicial member and an administrative member in certain tribunals we are only having one judicial member and certain tribunals we are only having administrative tribunal the quorum is not complete the entire staff is being paid their salaries but we are not being able to hammer the point the litigants are suffering the tribunalization which was great was a creature of the mindset to the effect that it would reduce the burden on the heavy dockets of the high court and the supreme court but the tribunalization which the tribunals which were created for speedy justice sometimes are being the cases are not being decided only because of the want of the appointments what is your take on that deep and uh, bhati ma'am i I'll let uh, mrs bhati uh, yeah reply first No, no, Vijay. It would have been uh, anyways. Okay, now that you put the ball in my court, see, there is an important <laughs> maxim that uh, that goes on with justice delivery. That justice should not only be done; it should appear to have been done. Uh, and you know, our system of judiciary. Uh, of course, we've been bickering so much. I'm 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 uh, a little skeptical what uh, Professor Fidel and uh, some of his other colleagues must be thinking about our system. But despite our deep. Uh, issues i mean uh, we, our justice delivery system our military justice system our military forces are amongst the most respected in the world uh, we are trying to iron out the problems that are there we are trying to red flag the issues which which uh, you know which can be prospective pitfalls um, uh, vis a vis uh, you know issues that that are best practices across the world uh, so you know uh, when professor fidel was talking about uh, you know the yale uh, drafts i have not seen it i will take a, take the time and look at it 
but uh, we need some of these uniform practices. Uh, for example, on gender issues, a huge amount of work has happened, whether it was, you know, domestic violence issues, whether it was cruelty issues, whether it was, uh, you know, uh, other uh, issues that of violence that women face. Uh, they, the, a huge pressure uh, has been formed by the pressure group that exists by international um, uh, agreements and norms and treaties. So, so similarly, we have to have that kind of a pressure group also existing. Uh, though, though I have my, you know, I have my uh, uh, reservations about the issue of uh, the violation of so-called violation of human rights by military forces, because I've also been involved in some of the ASPA cases, Armed Forces Special Powers Act. And we saw that some of our officers who are in the uh, in the line of fire, you know, and uh, India has very unique circumstances in that way. We have, we, the, the, but, you know, one major part of our territory, there is a proxy war being waged. And in that proxy war, otherwise the job of military is not for the, uh, you know, not their operation is not in the civilian areas. Their operation is on the line of control or uh, the border areas. It, when the proxy war becomes so, uh, uh, so mudded, that it is important to bring the army to operate there. Uh, that is when the Armed Forces Special Powers Act gives them that operational, uh, uh, functional, uh, functional, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, maneuverability, so that they can go on and carry out their work. Now, in that we have seen uh, in India, particularly, there has been a huge problem of FIRs, false FIRs, and uh, you know, exaggerated FIRs having been lodged against our uh, soldiers and men working in those areas. And then, uh, you know, what, what is expected is that these people will continue to go there as accused in their, those FIRs, continue to face the, 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 the you know, the, the, the system of trial, et cetera, uh, for uh, doing something that they have done in the line of duty. When the military justice system has the, the power, the potential, the, you know, the, the wherewithal to deal with these offenses, then they have to be dealt with there. And India does not have a system where uh, you know, military justice is, you know, uh, maybe like, a, you know, we, we give example of our neighbor Pakistan the most because we are familiar with their, uh, with their uh, functionings. So uh, it's not like there that military justice system is, is, is you know, uh, uh, it's like a tight box there that it has no, uh, uh, nobody has recourse to the civilian courts or the constitutional courts. That's not the case in India. So some issues uh, by the best practices, but of course, uh, some operational flexibility for uh, peculiar situations that exist in countries. Um, I would just ask, uh, we have discussed a lot. Yes, how sorry. does it operate? Uh, no, how, how does it operate in, uh, Mr. Uh, I will ask Professor Fidel, how does it operate out there? Um, well, uh, 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 let, let me make a couple of observations. Maybe maybe this will answer the uh, the mail. But uh, if if I, if I don't uh, ask again, uh, as I've listened to the conversation, uh, these things occur to me. Uh, the the first has to do with the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, um, which I am aware of, and uh, uh, I'm aware that India has wrestled with it um, repeatedly. Uh, to me, that opens up the question of what, who should have the power to decide whether there is concurrent jurisdiction between a civilian and a military process. This is one of the pressure points that countries face. And uh, I, the, the notion that the military commander should be the tiebreaker, and not the tiebreaker, have the first and last word, really, as to which courthouse a particular case goes to, uh, strikes me as unacceptable. Now, countries have resolved this in various ways. There might be a memorandum of understanding as between uh, the uh, director of uh, public prosecutions and the director of service prosecutions. It might be resolved, or it might be simply committed to some court. And if it's committed to some court, which court system should that should have that say? Uh, anyway, I, I just want to set that aside. It's the, the, the problem of concurrent jurisdiction. Uh, the second thing is, uh, and here I'm uh, thinking about Navdeep's uh, comments about the AFT and tribunalization in general. Uh, I, would, I would simply raise a question mark, uh, and I can say this based on US experience, as to the need for specialization uh, 
uh, I, I'm not talking about the, the uh, Inland Revenue uh, Tribunal, whatever. What I, I'm sure there is one in in India, but you know the the tax authorities. Uh, God God forbid I should ever get involved in a tax case. <laughs> but uh, as the military justice system increasingly assimilates, inevitably assimilates more towards the civilian criminal justice norm. And particularly as the military justice system continues to concern itself with offenses that are not inherently military. I have to say that I'm increasingly skeptical about the need for specialization. There's no reason why competent uh, appellate judges uh, can't, based on capable uh, briefing and capable oral argument, grapple with essentially any issue that could be raised under uh, the military justice system. Uh, as uh, my friend Dwight, who's listening in uh, attentively, uh, knows, uh, most of the cases that are decided by our US Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, which is a civilian court, by the way, um, have the concern issues. Many of them concern sex issues. The majority of them concern sex issues today. It's, it's rare that, that it's uh, it, a classic military justice concern, mutiny, disobedience, disrespect, this kind of thing. Uh, they're, they're today typically issues of uh, 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 sexual assault, uh, sexual assault or other misconduct involving children, pornography. These, these are the norm. And I'm here to tell you, you don't need a specialized tribunal to decide those cases. So th that's, that's in response to something that Nadeep said. The, the last point I want to make uh, is I want to forget the Supreme Court of India, forget the AFT, forget the high courts. Let's talk about the trial. Okay. My assumption is that the Indian Armed Forces run hundreds of courts martial of one kind or another uh, over the course of a year. Is it over a thousand? What, what do you think? Yes, over a thousand maybe? Yes, sir. Easily. Could be. Yeah, easily. So, and we're, we're up in that range also. Uh, it's, it's much lower than it once was because basically we get rid of people administratively now. Um, my question is, do you have a functional trial bench? What are the terms of reference for the attorneys who preside in those forums that involve a presiding officer with a law degree? What are the terms of reference for those people? Do you have something that can re reasonably, plausibly be called a trial judge? And if so, is that official independent and impartial? Does that official have any fixed tenure? Does that official, if, if there is a tenure of some kind, is it something more than simply a tour of duty? Uh, be, it, it, because unless you, I, I understand you want a good appellate system. I do too. But the best way to maximize your chances of having a good appellate system without 14,000 cases pending, by the way, is to get it done right at the trial. And unless you have a really good trial bench that is independent, impartial, where the judges will call the shots, they'll instruct the jury, they'll rule with an iron fist if need be, they'll keep the lawyers in line, they'll keep the cases moving, they'll generate a record that lends itself to meaningful appellate review, intelligent appellate review. You're kidding yourself. So if I were uh, the Minister of Defense, uh, my first priority would be to make sure that your trials were being conducted in a way that, uh, you, that achieved all those things, because then the rest of it is easy. Well, not easy, but it's a lot less difficult if you get it right the first place. So that's, that's I don't know if that's responsive to your question, but that, those are the thoughts that occurred to me. I, I'll, I'll, just, uh, I'll just clarify that. Uh, firstly, um, we have an ad hoc jury system, and uh, we don't have a judge on, on, on the court martial. We don't even have a legally person, a legally qualified person on the court martial, except the judge advocate who, who does not have a vote um, and uh, who can advise. 
so so yes uh, the system uh, at the first go but we're trying to see um, even even the uh, even our uh, defense minister his name was mr manohar parikar he had ordered a study group to go into this uh, which we had recommended in our committee of experts way back in 2016 he had ordered a study group and uh, he had passed orders that a study group has to be constituted to look into all these issues but still till date no executive orders have been issued so uh, yes we have that problem however uh, it's not to say that we don't have um, you know men and women of uh, steel who, who would uh, be able to review that uh, uh, system and say that no uh, here is where you you've gone wrong however we cannot rely on that so we must have a stable system we must have legally qualified people looking into these issues and we must have a permanent tenure based court martial i totally agree the um, Uh, uh, as I always say, that our our army act is pretty outdated. Our military justice is pretty outdated. But the saving grace is that it's not implemented in a draconian manner. And as uh, Mrs. Bhatia also pointed out, that at least we have the high courts and the Supreme Court absolutely looking into these matters and not saying that no, we will not. It's a military issue, and we will not look into it. It used to happen about thirty years, forty years earlier. But uh, as of now, at least. a person is not remediless and if he or she is not satisfied with the trial uh, he or she can approach the armed forces tribunal and then go to the high court or the supreme court as the case may be so at least the civil judiciary has its views absolutely on the system wherever it goes wrong but you are absolutely right sir that at the first go in the first layer itself uh, the system should be so robust That the cases do not increase. Uh, as far as the number of cases is concerned, the sixteen thousand, seventeen thousand cases before the AFD, uh, only a very small number is of courts martial. Rest of uh, of the cases are all service matters. You know, uh, pensions and pay and allowances and promotions, etc. The number of the courts martial is uh, pretty small. Uh, however, yes, uh, being the first, uh, the the trial, the first layer. um of uh, where a person uh, you know has to seek criminal justice uh, it it needs to be very very robust uh navdeep uh, the way professor fidel had given the insights thereafter i just felt that yes we are while we are discussing on the glo- global perspective otherwise we were all thinking uh, if we if we wouldn't have been on the platform it would have been we are think Uh, sitting locally and only thinking globally, but his insights have actually given a flip to our mindset also on the global. And we are having certain questions since we would be running short of time. On I, I, certain... I'm sorry, I, I just sorry, uh, I'll just take half a minute more uh, just to uh, clarify to Professor Fidel. Uh, Professor Fidel, another thing, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, um, the. what mrs bharti was pointing out that uh, you know the indian army uh, is not uh, against uh, judicial oversight at all and what we are bothered about is only vexatious uh, litigation not actual litigation because the the act itself also only uh, protects actions in good faith not other so if there's a bad ca- uh, faith action absolutely we don't you know uh, we don't uh, say that it must be protected only good faith actions has to be protected only vexatious litigation has to be protected and there is judicial oversight also if a decision is taken that uh, you know you you must try this uh, in a military court and uh, a person is not satisfied that uh, decision can be challenged in a civil court in the high court or it can go up to the supreme court so Uh, again people are not remediless whether it's the military litigants or the other side and that makes the system a little uh, you know better in india that uh, the judiciary actually functions and a person can approach a forum in case he or she is dissatisfied uh thanks navdeep now uh, since we generally plan a session for one and a half hour lot of healthy discussions going around and we i never realized i don't know about the other participants and the all the speakers who have just stepped in you ma'am bhati and then professor fidel that one and a half hour just uh, i never realized that one and a half hour is over but since there are questions we will not take uh, any other questions which are already on the chat box otherwise uh, it could also happen other way around that professor fidel is saying good evening to us and we are saying good morning to him <laughs> <laughs> so, so so you so we should take questions from the chat box Yes, yes, we can take the questions from the chat box. A- anybody of you can answer. I can ask. I will post the question. Anybody of you can answer. Vishwas Agarwal. 
what changes would you like to suggest in the constitution which will help to take military justice system more effective and efficient at the global level the uh, co constitution does not require any change i mean uh, uh, the the courts martial uh, are already under uh, the power of judicial review and in fact the latest judgment you know there's article 227 sub clause 4 which says that uh, courts martial are not uh, you know under the superintendence of uh, the high court and uh, but that um, if you look into the constituent assembly debates uh, of october 1949 chapter 10 uh, it clearly says that it is only with regard to evidence that they cannot examine evidence so now for examining evidence we have the armed forces tribunal and the latest judgment which mrs bhati uh, argued uh, roger matthews case uh, and in fact in, in which my case was also tagged called the deep singh versus union of india in which he was the counsel uh, in that it has been clarified that 2274 only uh, talks of administrative superintendence and not judicial superintendence so the constitution bench has clarified that uh, the the bar uh, on uh, under article 2274 uh, a court martial is only with regard to the administrative superintendence that the high court will not have administrative superintendence over court martial and not judicial uh, superintendence or judicial power of judicial review so i don't think any any further change is required uh -huh. i will ask shwarya ji because navdeep uh, while speaking on that platform he feels that everybody on the platform is all from the judicial background but once navdeep comes on the platform or ma'am bhatti comes or professor fidel comes there are participants who are from the civil so i'll just ask uh, ashwarya ji just to give an insight what is the difference between an administrative superintendence and what is the difference between a judicial superintendence just to make clear things clearer to the persons who are the participants yes well so so in layman's terms that, that as easily as i can explain administrative superintendence would, would be Uh, superintendents on administrative issues, how their functioning is, where they are functioning, who are the members, uh, how they will sit, where they will sit. The administrative issues uh, with regard to the functioning of the court martial. Whereas the judicial superintendents means examining the reason for uh, for their determination, examining the uh, the uh, you know the the uh, the ratio of their uh, their reasoning and why they have arrived at a particular determination. So that. that in my uh, submission would be the difference uh, uh, how do you uh, do you suppose something else also navdeep what is your take on that exactly the same what she said and including for example you know prescribing forms and cost etc whatever is mentioned in article 227 okay so exactly what mrs bhati said same okay i just wanted that people on the platform should know what is the distinction because sometimes one goes with such a flow be that as it may i am also a part of it sometimes one doesn't realize that there are participants beyond the law especially when the our team itself is captioned as beyond law and beyond law clc you so we have participants who are beyond law you are a resident encyclopedia in the high court you remember cases by citations on i mean you have them on your tips and angad puri asked uh, anybody of you can answer do you feel that there is a need for civil interference in military court martial um what do you mean by civil interference what does that mean probably speaking of the court interferences in that oh uh, can, yeah 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 there's there's no question uh, 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 just to give you uh, i'll use an image that uh that has worked for me the military is commonly said to be a separate society you know that's we have endless cases in the united states that say well it's separate society and the, the different rules apply and all that stuff my concern is and th this is a matter of political philosophy rather than law but my concern is as a matter of democratic policy in democratic society uh recognizing that there is there's a sense in which the military is separate and has some rules that don't apply to other people you don't want that ice flow to drift too far from the shore uh it it, it just we the the effort ought to be made to keep that ice flow as close as possible to the shoreline because otherwise i think inevitably uh the dangers uh to democratic society can get out of hand uh 
it, it, not, not to say the government will be overthrown or something like that, but it can have a distorting effect, sometimes only around a, the edges, but sometimes in more profound ways. And uh, that's why countries have civilian doctrines of civilian control of the military. They may not be uh, written in black letter. They may just be part of the country's political uh, value system, its norms. Um, in our country, the president who, uh, the president is the commander in chief, literally, the commander in chief. Now, actually, it's interesting. I don't think there's anything in our constitution that literally prevents a serving officer from being president, uh, but it would never happen, I think. Anyway, just a, just a thought. I, I, I think there are uh, some postulates that uh, control, even if they're not written down anywhere, and you can, you can have both ideas in mind at the same time, that yes, there are aspects in which the military you know, has to be able to do its own thing and there are customs and traditions. We get all that, anybody who's been in uniform fully aware of that. On the other hand, that's not the, the central issue. The central issue is the society as a whole. Okay, uh, this question is specifically pointed uh, towards Major Navdeep. Uh, from Angad Puri. Would you please shed some light on the NFU case being fought by Colonel Mukuldev in the Supreme Court regarding disability? No, it's not regarding disability. That's regarding non-functional upgradation. That is uh, subjudice. I mean, uh, no light can be shed by me. It's it, it's a subjudice case and it will be decided by the Supreme Court of India. Can't uh, comment on it. I mean, it's pending. Uh, uh, officers that won the case uh, uh, before the Armed Forces Tribunal, and a similar case was won in the Delhi High Court by members of the Central Armed Police Forces, and now uh, the the CAPF case was upheld by the Supreme Court, and the other military cases uh, currently pending in the Supreme Court. So, you can't say anything more than that. It's pending whenever it is decided. Yeah. Again, uh, subjudice would mean that the matter which is pending before any court would become a subjudice. I'm just clarifying. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, yes. yes. Sorry. <laughs> because sometimes one so much goes with the flow that one realizes that everybody, that's right. That's right. and especially once we have a professor on the platform, everybody yes. feels that whatever we, were, we are speaking is understood by everyone. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, can you please throw some light on recent judgment by Supreme Court, wherein the non-divisibility of ordinary family pension was upheld, which is imbibed in family regulations of all so three folks? Why, why recent? Uh, this judgment is very, very old, called Jodh Singh versus Union of India. So it simply says that uh, you know it cannot be divided in such manner. But, uh, but special family pension, which I'll explain to laypersons, which is um, a kind of a family pension which is granted uh, for debts which are relatable to military service, and the liberalized family pension, which are debts relate relatable to operational service. These two kinds of pension uh, are divisible, but not ordinary family pension. Ordinary family pension is thirty percent of emoluments. Special family pension is sixty percent of emoluments, and um, uh, liberalized is 100% of emoluments. But uh, I must also point out that even special family pension is not divisible as a matter of right. It depends upon the circumstances to prevent, uh, for example, to prevent destitution uh, if uh, the parents are absolutely, were absolutely dependent upon the deceased soldier and they have no other um, means of uh, livelihood. Uh, in such uh, cases, it can be divided on discretion after due uh, investigation. Uh, Jadeep Singh asks, can you comment on the narrow scope of AFT with public interest of larger number of defense litigants as well as the policy challenges? Yes, that's a very uh, uh, good question. Uh, I can't, uh, can you just repeat the question because I can't see it on the chat room, please? Uh, it's uh, posted at 736. Be that as it may, I'm reading it. Navdeep Ji, can you comment on the narrow scope of AFT with respect to public interest of larger number of defense litigation as well as policy challenges. Uh, yes, uh, Jaydeep Ji is a very uh, Jaydeep Bhatna is a very good friend, and uh, uh, so uh, yes, so L Chandra Kumar uh, Jaydeep Ji L Chandra Kumar said that uh, even uh, you know even subordinate legislation can be challenged in a tribunal, um, and uh, uh, so L Chandra Kumar the, the section 14 is analogous to section 14. I mean, the, the section 14 of the Administrative Tribunal Act, which was um, uh, in El Chandra Kumar, 
it is analogous to section 14 of the armed forces tribunal act so uh, one view is that uh, since uh, l chandra kumar says that even the tribunal can even quash subordinate legislation and quash policies the same would apply uh, to the aft but another view is that uh, a recent view in in the case of ngt in that uh, i think sterling case wherein uh, the bench held that no the tribunal cannot exercise um, the powers of constitutional courts and it is only the high court which can which can strike down such policies or take uh, such a decision now the matter went to the uh, delhi high court recently uh, in a case uh, last year uh, where in a very funny situation emerged uh, before the aft the council for the union of india took a view that uh, the the aft cannot look into policy matters uh, when that person went to the delhi high court the council for the union of india took a view that no no uh, they should go to the aft so ultimately the delhi high court said that no uh, Uh, the aft has already taken a view that they will not interfere hence now we are interfering and we hereby quash it quash this particular policy the matter went to the supreme court it was the judgment was affirmed by the supreme court in the first four leave was not granted and slp was dismissed so that's where the matter stands now uh, we will take since we are running, uh, already gone beyond the schedule a uh, last question from uh, it's to ashwarya ma'am please throw some light on gopiram case led by your good self which is still ongoing in order to supreme court in relation to validity of section 30 and 31 of the aft case it's the same ashwara ji it's the same same one yeah so uh, well th- we we challenged uh, you know very ambitiously we challenged the validity of section 30 and 31 uh, because the manner in which it was interpreted but uh, that is just a, a ambitious uh, overthrow but there are alternate prayers in that and now there is uh, really the steam is off from this because of uh, uh, of the judgment of um, uh, uh, navdeep ji has explained already at length um, uh, where they have already said that uh, you know uh, the, the high court cannot be curtailed in any case the aft itself the statute itself said that uh, judicial review under article 226 um, is preserved by the aft and that has been now uh, emphatically held so by a larger bench of the supreme court so there is uh, there's really no problem there we just waiting for a final order of course we we had marathon uh, hearings of that matter uh, navdeep ji explained that at length and after you know almost concluding the matter uh, that matter also went through ups and downs like anything but the hearing almost concluded and the judgment was to be reserved but the bench said well we have one or two questions tomorrow and we'll ask that and then it went into a loop and the matter could not be heard we there were other important matters that took up but now uh, th- we will probably not need more than a, a, a just a formal determination by the court because uh, the point has been covered the issue was that uh, you know stopping litigants uh, uh, or uh, uh, cases it were coming from armed forces tribunal stopping them uh, or you know prohibiting them from going to a high courts was a big problem to the litigants and it was against uh the constitutional bench judgments and the mandate of aft itself so i think we've crossed that bridge uh, uh, before we before we break um i i wanted to make uh, one uh one uh, non commercial announcement um i've just posted on the uh chat feature uh word about as a webinar or a zoom town hall that is going to be uh, sponsored tomorrow morning at the same time or t- I guess t- tomorrow night for you uh at the same time um uh, for global military justice reform we're going to be doing these town hall zoom meetings the first monday in every month and uh, this is the fourth one we're having and the, the uh guest speaker will be brigadier retired anthony pafidi who was the director of uh, service prosecutions in the UK and he's going to be talking about the report prepared by uh, Mr Justice Sean Lyons for changes in the UK military justice system and I think it might be worthwhile and in in any event admission is free and you're welcome to attend uh i i uh, mr chatrat i've just received a private message from mr uh, uh, thomas from uh, uh, canada uh, can i just yeah. answer it it's just a private message so yeah, the, yeah, no the, issues. yeah. So no, so may, may, it could have been posted privately but the once the message is not will become uh, public yes <laughs> it, it is uh, uh, posted privately but i'll reply in public 
uh, you know, we believe in transparency. Uh, Mrs. Bharti fought that uh, uh, privacy case. So, and she said that we believe in transparency. India believes in transparency. So I, I must answer it in public. So the question is that in the, in the Indian court martial system, is the court obliged to accept the instructions of the judge advocate on matters of law? Or does the judge advocate simply advise? Yes, the judge advocate simply advises. It's not binding. Okay. Uh, we have Advocate Savitri uh, Nisha, who is also a professor fortuitously. She wanted to express some words of after the session. We have just unmuted her. Uh, Ma'am, yes. Hello. Uh, how are you, sir? Uh, this is Savitri Dhanesha. And it has been an immense pleasure. I take an immense pleasure in stating that uh, the program has been great. The idea has been very novel. Probably people like us who do not know anything about AFT, we, it was uh, purely a knowledge sharing and a thought provoking session. We have really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. And I hope Beyond Law CLC will come up with uh, more such programs. I really like to thank uh, Mr. Jean Fidel, Ashwarya Bhatiji, and Navdeep Ji. I think uh, the way they have showered us with knowledge, uh, I really thank them from the bottom of the uh, bottom of my heart. I've really enjoyed the session thoroughly, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vikas ji. Thank you, Vikas thank you, ji, for organizing such a program. Uh, as ma'am was saying that we will have sessions. Tomorrow yes, we have a session on uh, Right to Silence by a senior advocate from Gujarat, uh, Mr. Seem Pandya, who has also been the president of the Gujarat Bar Association. <laughs> so stay connected. Uh, we have already posted the message that you can connect us through Facebook page or Instagram page for latest updates or our mobile number. Now, uh, thank you so uh, much. Thank you. Uh, it would be a pleasure that we get the insights from people like you that encourages us to do better. And one message like Navdeep received on the WhatsApp, I have also received one message. They say that uh, Ms. Bharti is a niece of their very close friend, uh, Professor Bharti. She's uh, he's a doctor. I'm just reading the name. I've just received the message that kindly convey our uh, feelings. Meanwhile, we have Sujoy Kantawala, who is already uh, just like Navdeep uh, and Ashwarya, who, co who comes quite often on the TV to give his insights. Sujoy's smile shows it all that he has actually thoroughly enjoyed the program. I just wish that we could unmute uh, everybody so that we could have the expressions. But our experience has been. Yeah. Can I say, yeah. Mr. Fidel, Major Singh, good friend Aishwarya. Uh, uh, I have uh, as articulate and elegant as always, Aishwarya. Uh, we have been together on so many TV debates on various social issues. But uh, I'm so glad. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm here in the Corona hotspot of India, Mumbai. But I'll tell you uh, what a fantastic evening and a Sunday evening to spend with all of you all. I mean, this is such an unknown, uncharted territory for most of the councils like me. And now that I know Aishwarya is, uh, <laughs> any matter like this, I have to refer to her immediately. Fantastic. Uh, salute to all of y'all. And the way you have explained in such simple language that guys like me and so many other uh, participants who never knew about this niche territory, now are, I have become so aware of the uh, uh, fine niceties of this particular field of jurisprudence and law. Thank you so much again from the bottom of my heart. Uh, Very kind of you. So, uh, thankfully, there are no uh, further questions. And I always say that once there are no, not many questions, one is that we have al already said that we should have some way stopped. Uh, that's good on the part of the participant that they have understood the timeline should be actually followed in stricter sense. So, unless once we are going globally, let's people carry the image that we don't go by the scheduled time. Uh, we are quite thankful before. Please, please explain stricto senso. Uh, please that you will have to explain. To the <laughs> and that you will have to explain this time. <laughs> you, you're the Dominus Littis. <laughs> you will have to explain. And Dominus Littis, uh, Ashwarya will explain. <laughs> yeah. Explain it stricto senso. No, no, no. I, 
No, it's your fault. It. <laughs> you no, you no. are the one who has used it for the layperson. I think I think <laughs> yeah, just leave it for everybody to decide on. Uh, we can we can have a. You were pulling your leg because you were uh, making every all of us explain those uh, terms. We can have a, a another session on Latin maxims. Yes, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Very, a great idea, Navdeep ji. I think. No, I, just, I just noticed one thing. May I just butt in? I just noticed one thing that uh, uh, both uh, all both of you, uh, Major Singh and Aishwarya, you all were discussing that, and you informed us that so many judgments of the Supreme Court have not been implemented. You know that is something that uh, is really sad. That uh, Supreme Court judgments, which are final binding across the length and breadth of India and so many instances you have given, that is something that we need, need to have a lot of concern for. It's very sad. In fact, the political executive, that's the problem, that the political executive want these to be implemented. The Prime Minister has made a statement. The uh, uh, Raksha Mantri has made a statement. Uh, the last Raksha Mantri, I mean, uh, late Mr. Manohar Parikar made a statement. Even Mr. Anthony make, made a statement. So. The entire uh, political spectrum wants litigation to decrease. The attorney general has written, the solicitor general has written for reducing litigation, but the lower level functionaries are, are not allowing it to happen. It's very sad. Uh, 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 Navdeep Bhai, before we actually part, we can connect uh, besides this platform also. Now you have been uh, connected me to a wonderful person, Ashwarya, and then Professor Fidel. And one question, uh, Professor Fidel, some people have just posted, what is the time, Indian standard time, or what is your time when your this Zoom invite has been given? The invite uh, looks uh, to be uh, quite tempting, so people would like to latch on. It's uh, uh, 9, 9 a.m., which is to say... Uh, um, 9 a.m. would be 6.30. 9 a.m. East. East Coast US time, and everybody's welcome. Uh, while I have the floor, I just want to say this. I, I commend uh, you for organizing this. Uh, it's a privilege to meet you all uh, and to see some familiar faces. Um, I also will say that I hope everyone stays well. Uh, we, we haven't talked about the, uh, there, the, there actually are military legal implications to the pandemic. Uh, I'm, I'm currently doing some uh, writing on that subject, uh, but most importantly, I hope everybody stays well and continues to take appropriate precautions. Uh, and uh, I will also say while I'm at the store that uh, if you've been following the news, uh, the United States is going through a particularly uh, terrible patch right now uh, that I'm sure you're all roughly aware of. Uh, I haven't uh, tuned in uh, for the last two hours, but I'm hoping that today will be a more quiet day than uh, last night and the night before. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, life goes on with new challenges and I hope that you're able to surmount uh, those that you're facing and that uh, uh, will be okay as well. Thank you, Professor Patel. Uh, Navdeep, uh, many people are asking what is the title of the book and what what actually it covers, which you have, I just uh, seen uh, more like a curtain raiser on the Facebook that you had said that it's a soft launch. Uh, so see, my, the latest book is called Military Pensions, uh, Commentary, Case Law and Provision. So it's like a reference book for, uh, you know, entire issue, uh, the entire uh, gamut of uh, the aspect of pensions, the different types of pensions in layperson terms, not in legal ma uh, Latin maxims. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, my the book prior to that was called Named by the System. So it was real life stories of uh, people, military veterans, uh, disabled soldiers, etc., who had to fight battles with the system and then legally claim their rights. Um, so, uh, uh, I mean, uh, because of the pandemic, uh, Amazon is having problems because uh, some of the distributors were in red zones, but uh, it is available directly from the publishers. And you can just go uh, to my uh, personal book website called uh, www.navdeep.info that uh, uh, contains all, all information about the books, uh, the subject matter, etc. Navdeep.info. Uh, can we still, uh, see the cover of the book? At least uh, I have seen on the Facebook. You have that book in and around? Uh, no, not around me. I'm sitting in my drawing room. <laughs> <laughs> 
I thought that uh, Amazon is having troubles, but at least we should see uh, the curtain raiser in the right perspective. Yes, uh, I guess. And uh, thank you, everyone, on behalf of Beyond Law CLC and ULS Punjab University Chandigarh. Uh, we are just. And I, I also want to thank some, uh, 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 Mr. Mr. Chatrath, there are many decorated officers from all, all around the globe who have joined yes. us. Special yes, yes. special thanks to them, uh, including Colonel Sullivan um, um, and uh, um, General Ghosh, General Sapru, and many Colonel Sharma. Many of them I, I can see, I can see familiar names. Uh, Colonel Ajin Kumar, so uh, thanks to all. Some of them are, um, you know, very gallant officers, and, and thanks to everyone, especially from the U.S. Marine Corps. <laughs> Uh, that that is quite uh, heartening and encouraging for us also that people with who have actually served for the nation uh, are joining us for the insights and especially when they know that people who are experts in this field are pitching in their views in the point which could be actually done. As I was saying that uh, we are all enamored with the way you have sh shown the perspective I was sharing with uh, Ms. Bhatti and Navdeep that invariably we had a, always the session and then we had a q and I was just talking to Navdeep prior to the session also that we will be going for a session. It's more an interactive session. This week, we are all mainly with the interactive session like sports law. We were having we, with the senior counsel, Puneet Bali and Yuvraj Singh. Then we have live in relationship, with the contemporary law. And that, fortuitously, Navdeep and Bharti ma'am, we can ask them. They will be participant, and one of the key speakers would be Sujay Kantawala and Tanvir Meer. And then we have Raj Khosla, <coughs> famous director, uh, who has done a lot of ad movies and movies, uh, plus movies also, to have the contemporary law that's quite challenging. So we are all thankful on behalf of Beyond Law and CLC. And we have Shubit Fatela, a bright lawyer practicing the <laughs> court. So I thought. His insights, what he has experienced, and a vote of thanks from a young budding lawyer who is ex doing exceedingly well within the profession. Shubhit, over to you. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words. This truly has been a very interesting and a thought-provoking session, sir. I, for one, did not have the complete picture of military laws, and today's webinar was really enriching and has inspired me to look deeper into the issues of law, especially this field of uh, military laws, not only from the perspective of India, but also from the perspective of other jurisdictions. I formally thank the speakers, Mr. Jean Fidel, Madam Ishwarya Bhatti, and Major Navdeep Singh for sparing their valuable time in their respective time zones and sharing their rich experiences. It definitely was a learning experience and encouraging for a young lawyer like me. There's a lot to learn and a lot to take back from today's conversation. Mr. Jean Fidel's views have been very ins insightful, especially with respect to civilian and military trials. Sir has outlined two areas of law which have been overlooked, and perhaps there is a lot of scope of research in these issues. One being correct correctional programs for military convicts, and second being professional ethical issues and the need to make policies in this regard. Sir has also emphasized on the need of generally accepted principles which must be adopted and an effort which must be made by governments all across. Thank you so much, sir, for being a part of the seminar. Madam Ashwarya Bhatti's contribution towards the development of law has especially been very encouraging. Opportunity for women in permanent commissions in the Indian Army is a pertinent issue. The judgment which has been cited is not only a gender victory, but is also important in bringing men and women to an equal level playing field. As Madam said, Battling gender inequality is a battle of mindset. Thank you, ma'am, for being a part of this talk. Major Navdeep Singh has pointed out the flaws of tribunalization. Sir has very well elucidated on the history of tribunalization from the case of El Chandra Kumar to Madras Bar Association and the Roger Matthews case. The insights which have been provided by Sir are very nuanced and there is a lot to take back from the conversation and definitely a lot to read for all of us, especially all the young lawyers given that now we've gotten a good perspective about the issues of law involved. Thank you, sir, for being a part of this. At last, I'd like to thank Mr. Chatrath for organizing this seminar. The webinar has rightly been titled as Beyond Law. It's not only about general civil or criminal laws, but also about diverse areas of law, which one 
may not be very well aware of, including me. And these issues assume great importance in our day-to-day -day life. I thank you, sir, for conducting this, sir. Thank you all. Uh, thank you. Stay blessed. Stay safe. Thank you so and, much. And uh, let's see the legal maxims, etc. How do they actually shape up? That they, as they say, just as a uh, seed which is uh, creeped up in the mind actually turns into a plant and then ultimately becomes a tree which everybody will cherish. So let's see how, how things actually sh shape up. Everyone stay yeah. safe. Stay safe. Can, I, can I give you a legal maxim in Latin? Sure, yeah. Do. yeah. I you, mean, we, we have to... Short. Short. Vox populi, vox day. But but the, the maxim I want to share is the, the time-honored error communist non fake it lex, which means the fact that everybody's wrong doesn't make it law. <laughs> the, bar, the parting shot is the final shot. Right. <laughs> what a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a lovely evening.